Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Paris Schutz reporting live from South Suburban Riverdale. On the show tonight. We are very concerned by the growing civilian casualties in both Gaza and Israel. Conflict between Israelis and Palestinians escalates. We hear from two sides about how the current conflict got to this point. It's not about one of us, it's about all of us. Vaccination rates in South Suburban Cook County lag behind the rest of the county. We check in with the village of Riverdale. A suite of wireless pregnancy monitors could transform prenatal care. A look at the legacy of late architect Helmut Jahn in a special edition of Ask Jeffrey. Vintage color photographs of Chicago people and places from the eye of Vivian Meyer. Some exciting news Monty and Rose are expecting. We've got those details. It challenges our conceptions of value. And how a Chicago artist is turning digital art into a sculpture. And Brandis, as we mentioned earlier, I'm in South Suburban Riverdale tonight. Not to be confused with Riverdale, the community area on the south side of Chicago. That's just over the Calumet River from here, so we're south of that. This community is near dead last in terms of COVID vaccination rates in the county and in the state. We'll have more on exactly why that is and what local officials plan to do about it. But first, we toss it back to you. Paris, thank you. And now to some of today's top stories. Rules around mask wearing could be getting looser. City and state officials say they will review current orders requiring masks indoors now that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says that those who are fully vaccinated can stop wearing masks outdoors in crowds and in most indoor settings two weeks after their second shot or their first shot for the single doses. And more people will be allowed in businesses, restaurants, offices, and other gathering spots starting tomorrow as the state officially enters its bridge phase, the last step before phase five, which is a full reopening. This will increase for many of them to 60% for this next uh, phase, but also weddings will increase in the number of people meant much more than from 50 to 60%, other kinds of outdoor gatherings and so on. And then we'll you know, be moving uh, relatively shortly, 28 days to phase five. The city of Chicago is joining the state in this bridge phase and is announcing a full expansion of the vaccine exemption. This means businesses will not have to count vaccinated people toward capacity limits as long as they verified that the patrons are vaccinated. Governor J.B. Pritzker says the state will continue to monitor hospital admissions for COVID-19 as well as the death rate and ICU bed availability over the next 28 days. Barring any significant reversals in those rates, the state will move to phase five on June 11th. And there's more of this story on our website. Meanwhile, Illinois public health officials report another 1,900 cases of the coronavirus today and 35 additional deaths. More than 1,361,000 people have been infected in Illinois since the pandemic began, and 22,320 people have died. The state's test positivity rate is at 3.2% today. 11th Ward Alderman Patrick Daly Thompson pleads not guilty in federal court today. The two term alderman is accused of filing false tax records. The government claims Daly Thompson said he paid interest on money he received from the former Washington Federal Bank, even though prosecutors allege he knew that he had not paid that interest. The 51 year old did not speak during a virtual arraignment today, but his attorney says he's eager to get to trial to clear his name as soon as possible. Thompson is facing seven charges of making false banks or false statements to bank regulators and filing false tax returns. To find out more about those charges, you can visit our website. And now to Phil Ponce for a look at a growing conflict in the Middle East. Phil. Brandis, tensions between Israelis and Palestinians are still heated as more rockets and airstrikes come down on either side. More than 100 people have reportedly died in Gaza and seven have died in Israel. Joining us to talk about the conflict are Richard Goldberg, senior advisor at the Foundation for Defense, Defense of Democracies, and Hatem Abudeya, the national chair of the United States Palestinian Community Network and a spokesperson for the Chicago Coalition for Justice in Palatine. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. And you both have families and friends in the affected areas. Uh, Hatem Abudeya, what are you hearing from them? Well, we're hearing that um, there's a lot of concern and it's growing um, that, you know, people that our family members in the West Bank um, of mine and then friends 
in Jerusalem especially, who have been in the, in the eye of the storm, so to speak, uh, where, where the escalation has been clearly initiated by Israel, especially the threats of forced evictions of over a thousand residents of Sheikh Jarrah and other neighborhoods in Jerusalem, part of really a, a, a policy of ongoing ethnic cleansing and attempts to establish an Israeli Jewish majority in, uh, in Jerusalem. And you know, the people that I know there are concerned about being pushed out of their homes and, and they're concerned about the Israeli military, police, and the racist settler gangs who continue to attack Palestinians in the streets of Jerusalem, including those that were chanting death to Arabs while they were doing it. Richard Goldberg, uh, before we get to some of the issues that uh, Hatim Abu Day just mentioned, what are you hearing from the people you know? Yeah, my social media feed is filled with friends and family showing pictures of them and their loved ones at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning as the rockets are raining down throughout Israel, huddled up with their children crying uh, in their bomb shelters and really asking if, if this was Chicago and we were under attack from a terrorist organization raining rockets down on Chicago, what would we ask President Biden to do in response? Uh, of course, we're not going to have a moral equivalency between a democracy uh, fighting for its own self-defense and a terrorist organization raining down indiscriminately to target civilians. Richard Goldberg, we just heard Hatim Abudeya say that the precipitating event were the uh, evictions. Uh, in your view, what is the, what has been the precipitating event? Yeah, that's really a pretext that Hamas has been using. Uh, this neighborhood with the housing dispute really goes back to the late 19th century when it was a Jewish neighborhood all the way till 1947, 1948. And when the Jordanians came during the Israeli War of Independence, uh, they kicked out the Jewish residents and Arabs took some of those homes. Now, a lot of those people did not get title to those homes. And so similarly to how decades later we've seen Jewish families sue for artwork that the Nazis stole, there's been litigation going through the Israeli courts to take back some of these homes as well. But really what we had was a Palestinian election that had been scheduled for later this month. It was canceled. And Hamas, if they had participated, would have done very well in those elections. So those elections were canceled by the Palestinian Authority. The president of the Palestinian Authority is completing his 16th year of a four-year term, not exactly a flourishing democracy in the Palestinian territories. But Hamas, the terrorist organization, said, you know what? This is a new opportunity. It's a new president of the United States. The Abraham Accords, the Arab-Israeli normalization that have been taking place uh, leave us sort of uh, behind. We want to reassert ourselves and show some power. And so they instigated some violence and now are obviously uh, raining down rockets across Israel. Hatim Abadeh, how about it? Is it more, does it go beyond the, uh, the evictions? Is it... Uh... Is it more nuanced, as uh, we just heard Mr. Goldberg say? Yeah, it's absolutely more nuanced. This is not a, a legal dispute. It's just really another example of, of white settler colonialism and, and ethnic cleansing. Um, even Beit Salem, the Israeli Human Rights Organization, the International Human Rights Organization, Human Rights Watch, are calling this land grab an example of why Israel is an apartheid state. 25 House Democrats have signed a letter co-sponsored by Illinois Representative Marie Newman and Wisconsin Representative Mark Pocan asking the Secretary of State to condemn the evictions. And uh, it's really ridiculous when uh, apologists for Israel, like Rich Goldberg, talk about how the Israelis are uh, responding in self-defense. Uh, you can't be responding in self-defense if you are the aggressor. Um, if you have the strongest military in the region, the most well-equipped, the most technologically advanced, and you're attacking essentially a civilian population, those racist white supremacist gangs of settlers who were attacking the Palestinians and chanting death to Arabs, um, they're emboldened by a government of Netanyahu that is also white supremacist. It reminds me a lot, Phil, of our own situation in the United States, where white supremacists were attacking black people, immigrants, other people of color, and they were emboldened by Trump because Trump was a, is a white supremacist as well. And so when let's, Israel uh, is get, initiating... Uh, you, you've, made, uh, you've made some, uh, in, uh, some 
important points, Richard uh, Hatem Abudea. Richard Goldberg, your your uh, response to the assertion that this uh, is comparable to white supremacy in this country. Well, it's a pretty disgusting attack, quite frankly, and borders anti-Semitism, to be frank. Uh, but listen, uh, Hamas is a foreign terrorist organization. It's been designated by that by both Democratic and Republican presidents of the United States. They are responsible for killing American citizens, not just Israelis, over many years. Palestinian Islamic Jihad, another terrorist organization, is coordinating with Hamas in these attacks. We know that it's controlled, taking orders from Tehran. Iran, the leading state sponsor of terrorism in the world, supports these terrorist groups. And Israel is a democracy, rated free by Freedom House. Uh, it's really, you know, with a functioning judiciary, uh, a flourishing democracy. And so, you know, we don't need to sit here and listen to propaganda that tries to equate a terrorist organization with a flourishing democracy that is one of the closest allies of the United States. Uh, we know the truth. And tonight we pray for those uh, who are in harm's way. We hope the violence stops. We hope Hamas stops the rocket attacks. And very quickly, we will restore peace. Phil, the truth is, is that um, it's not just Hamas that's responding. This is uh, the entire resistance movement in Palestine, including all of the political forces, are, are resisting Israel's violence against the Palestinian people. In unity, together, fighting for our self-defense and the defense of the people that Israel has been attacking uh, mercilessly, really, for not just weeks or months, but, but decades. A policy of an Israeli policy that is trying to push more and more Palestinians out of Jerusalem so that Jerusalem will remain a majority Israeli Jewish city that's why we call Israel an apartheid state. That's why Israel actually is, is now being isolated across the world. It is a pariah state, even in the United States. The Excuse Democratic me. Party, the base of the Democratic Party, and its legislators are starting to realize what Israel represents. A we're white, out, we're settler, almost out of time. And I, state. Excuse me for interrupting. We're almost out of time, and I'd like to give uh, Richard Goldberg a chance to respond. Where, where do we go from here, Richard Goldberg? Yeah, listen, I, I think that Hamas has already accomplished what it set out to accomplish, which was to put itself back on the radar to be part of the discussion in the Middle East going forward. Uh, a divide administration's in Vienna right now in indirect talks with the Iranians uh, regarding potentially going back to the nuclear deal. There's a possibility of more normalization between additional Arab states and Israel. So they wanted to assert themselves with the cancellation of the Palestinian elections. They've done that. Uh, the Israelis have some uh, strategic objectives that they're pursuing right now to take out the command and control of the Hamas terrorist leaders, uh, their operational uh, capabilities and their intelligence capabilities. Once the Israelis feel that they've done that, uh, then I think we will quickly see a de-escalation. And gentlemen, so much more to talk about. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. My thanks to Hatem Abudeya and Richard Goldberg. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Phil, thank you. All signs point to a growing recovery from COVID as Illinois is set to enter its bridge phase tomorrow and the CDC issues new guidance about mask wearing outside. But some communities are lagging way behind in vaccination rates and many are clustered on the south and southwest sides of the city. Riverdale is a village just south of the border of Chicago, home to a majority African-American population. And Riverdale has among the lowest vaccination rates in the entire county. As part of our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series, Paris Schutz and producer Marissa Nelson spent the day there to figure out why and what local leaders say they plan to do about it. Paris joins us now from the Riverdale Park District. Paris. Yeah, Brandis, consider Illinois' vaccination rate right now, 36% fully vaccinated. The rate here in South Suburban Riverdale is at 14% and only 20% uh, receiving their first shot. So those rates are lagging way behind 
Now, Riverdale suffers from a high rate of poverty and disinvestment. It's a town of around 13,000 residents, 26% of which live below the poverty level. So that presents a host of challenges when dealing with COVID. For starters, uh, many people don't have cars, so getting around here or the other south suburbs around here, you have to hop on pace. It might not be as easy as being in the city and hopping on the CTA. Also, people don't have access to health care or primary care physicians, and that leads to confusion when asking questions about COVID and vaccination and whether the vaccines are safe. You don't have that primary care physician that you trust to answer those questions. And so that's where Cook County health officials come in doing pop-up events around the south suburbs trying to overcome those barriers. They don't have uh, access to public transportation. Um, as we understand, in, in some of those communities, not a lot of people drive, for example. Um, so those are certainly barriers. Also, there are, there's certainly a, a certain level of hesitancy in those communities. Um, uh, mainly, there are mainly uh, communities of color, African-American communities that have not had easy or ready access to uh, health care. And in Riverdale, we didn't really find any permanent vaccination sites. And so agencies like the Park District here have had to step up as well, doing pop-up sites. Uh, they did one in April, uh, hosting vaccine clinics for residents. They're planning to do another one this week at various sites throughout the community. For the most part, most people want to have it at a smaller location, not just a mass vaccination site. Um, I think it's more personable. I think they feel like it's not, I'm just not uh, uh, on a line somewhere just getting the shot. Uh, I did have a few people tell me that they had to drive through and get the shot and they weren't so comfortable with that. And me, myself, I probably wouldn't have been either. And that's the same thing we heard nearby in Harvey at the Family Christian Health Center, a federally qualified health center. Dr. Lisa Green there tells us that same thing. The biggest barrier is a trustworthiness of providers. People are skeptical of the vaccine, especially if they only hear about it on social media and from neighbors. So she says there's many questions that patients have when they come in. One was afraid that symptoms from the vaccine would be worse than COVID symptoms, so they weren't sure what to do about it. Dr. Green had to sort of calm their nerves there, which is why having community caregivers do the bulk of vaccine administration makes all the difference. Community care wasn't just in the building that we resided in, but it was the community. And sometimes you got to move out of that space that you're in to get people to where they need to be. And so we started going out into the community, to churches, to schools, um, to businesses and things like that. If we got to go door to door, whatever that is, that's going to give people enough information that they feel like they can make an informed choice and move forward. And indeed, we met a, a patient from nearby suburban Midlothian who said that she would only do it at this facility. No, I mean, my doctor been taking care of me for a while. And so I've been coming here for like maybe about 10, 14 years. In Riverdale and some of the surrounding communities, South Holland, Dixmore, Harvey, they, they do suffer from higher rates of violence. Uh, and so a big concern over the last year is Police departments keeping their members safe. Some of these police departments say they're understaffed. So, what happens in the case uh, of an outbreak, a COVID outbreak, among the police force? The chiefs from South Holland, the chiefs from Dalton. Uh, we had a meeting when this when this all started. Uh, if uh, you know, if one of our departments got taken out completely, which which is very easy, easy to happen when you have somebody who has it and gives it to everybody else, that we would fill in and help with the the other agencies and then we also contacted the state and county as another backup but luckily none of our towns needed to actually take over another person's town and we mentioned the struggles the community faces covid or otherwise resident john tay spencer founded a nonprofit here for kids called communities creating change it aims to get them into after school activities like arts and crafts organic cooking many other creative things to help them deal with the trauma that many of them face. The community suffers from um, police harassment, just like any other black community. This uh, community suffers from, um, the community doesn't have enough educational programs, which is why my non-for-profit is so important.
because our mission is to uh, break that, break generational curses, is to break that generational gap where um, the family is separate. No, it's child, parent, grandparent. I create programs that they can do together. And Riverdale here is also home to Chuck's Gun Shop. That's an establishment that's drawn the ire of public officials in the city of Chicago and gun control advocates across the country for many, many years. A lot of firearms that wind up uh, in crime scenes in the city, they originated at Chuck's Gun Shop. It's something that, that's caused a lot of anger over the years. We asked uh, to speak to the owner of Chuck's. They declined our request today. And we will be back uh, with more from some public safety and other public officials here in Riverdale. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Paris, thanks. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back right after this with some vintage photographs of Chicago people and places. It really is about community where we all come together. Chicago needs to make space for everyone. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. And there's much more ahead on the program, including a look at the legacy of the late architect Helmut Jahn with Jeffrey Bayer. But first, when she died 12 years ago, photographer Vivian Meyer went from anonymous to fairly famous. She's had books on her work published, an Oscar-nominated documentary, and photo exhibits all over the world. Now, the one-time North Shore nanny is receiving more posthumous praise. This time, it's for a show of her mostly unseen color photographs of people and places. Chicago Tonight's Mark Vitale has that story. She took many images of children, sometimes the kids that she cared for. And she had a sensitive eye for Chicago buildings and infrastructure. There are scenes of the loop in 1970 and the rubble from the demolition of the Chicago Stock Exchange. When she was alive, Vivian Meyer was unknown to curators and historians. Now she's getting the second show of her work at the Chicago History Museum. And it's all in vivid color. We look across the spectrum of activity in Chicago and look for ways to reveal something about Chicago, Chicagoness, <laughs> the people who are here, what are they doing, how are they shaping how we think about the place we live in. Creativity comes out in a lot of these uh, sort of questions as we're asking ourselves, you know, what's, what are people doing and how are they sort of reflecting the city in that. So to look at this work, I think, is to reveal something not only about her, this, this amazing artist, and the, and the quality of the work that she generated, but something about us as well. If you're familiar with Vivian Meyer's work, you know about her self-portraits. She often found inventive ways to document her presence in the photographs. Most of these color works are focused in and around Chicago. One of the things I really like about looking at her work is that sometimes it's not evident. You don't immediately see it as a Chicago work, and yet a little bit of time, you, you sort of capture a sense that this reflection is of, is of that building. And you, you can sort of ground this scene she's photographing in context, in a place in Chicago. So place is really clearly important to her. The exhibition includes a selection of Super 8 movies that she shot, including more on the demolition of Adler & Sullivan's Stock Exchange building. The works came from a donation to the Chicago History Museum by a local art collector who wants the pictures to be accessible. She's able to walk that fine line between being sort of voyeuristic and, and dispassionate and being so, so empathetic that she sort of can figure out how to sort of live within that small, intimate world that that person is in at that moment and yet continue to keep her art-making self on task, which is to capture this picture at the right time with the right light levels, with the right framing time and again. I think that that's one of the ways of Vivian and her history can inspire us, right? I mean, here is this amazing artist who never had the sort of critic's eye, never had any popular 
uh, success, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in our culture, and yet was creating these fantastic works. And it gives me hope, right, that, that our, our world is more full of creativity and great art making and, you know, maybe even something that comes to genius, that we have time to elevate and recognize and give attention to. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. And if you're new to the Vivian Meyer story, visit us online to see Jay Shefsky's original report on the discovery of her work. It's an epic story with more great photographs of Chicago people and places. The show of Vivian Meyer's color photos just opened for a long run at the Chicago History Museum. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, housing in the southern suburbs. What could happen when the eviction moratorium eventually ends? We talk with a Cook County Commissioner about that and more. Pregnancy monitors are a cumbersome mass of wires that can be a burden and require adjustment. A team from Northwestern aims to change that. Our favorite piping plovers, Monty and Rose, are having quite the experience at Montrose Beach. We share some good news. Jeffrey Bayer on the monumental impact of the late architect Helmut Jahn in tonight's all new Ask Jeffrey and exploring the future of digital art and NFTs in a new immersive installation. We have the details. But first, some more of today's top stories. Chicago Public Schools could have a new leader in place by the end of July, according to a timeline the city and the district laid out today. Mayor Lori Lightfoot and the Chicago Board of Education say the process to replace outgoing CEO Janice Jackson will be the most inclusive in recent history. The district plans to hear feedback from 30 focus groups. A search firm has already been hired to source potential applicants from across the country. Then a selection committee that includes district leaders as well as teachers and parents will interview semifinalists. The mayor and board president will make the final recommendation to be approved by the Board of Education. Jackson's contract ends at the end of June and an interim CEO will be appointed to serve before the next CEO's start date. And Board of Education President Miguel Del Valle will discuss the process more on Saturday's Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. Be sure to tune in for that at 6 p.m. Gospel great Purvis Staples, known as a member of legendary, the legendary family act, the Staples Singers, has died. Purvis's tenor voice complimented his father's and sister's voices as the group gained fame in the 60s, singing music that urged change on a variety of social and religious issues. Many will recall that first number one hit, I'll Take You There. The 85-year-old died at his family home in Dalton. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee is survived by his children and grandchildren and Sister Mavis, the only surviving member of the Staples Singers. And legendary Chicago political reporter Dick Kay has also died. The 84-year-old died at his home in St. Charles after suffering a brain hemorrhage last weekend. For 38 years, Kay worked for WMAQ Channel 5, covering countless politicians and court trials. He was also known as a tireless union advocate and leader. And now we check back in with Paris Schutz, who spent the day reporting in South Suburban Riverdale as a part of our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series. Paris. Yeah, Brandis, we're here with uh, Riverdale Fire Department Chief Mick Smith. Chief Smith, uh, thanks for joining us out here in the park tonight. Uh, before we talk about COVID, it was a pretty tense day around here. There was a car chase, carjacking, a, a double shooting. Uh, how'd you all deal with all that? Um, unfortunately, sometimes we get a spillover from some things that happen in Chicago, but through collaborative efforts with Dalton, South Holland, and Riverdale, we were able to maintain everything and handle all of the situations, you know, as best as we could. I saw it in that police chase, and the fenders were caught. There were Dalton uh, police officers, South Holland police officers, Riverdale police officers. Seems like there's a lot of collaboration. So, all right, let's talk about COVID here in Riverdale. We mentioned a high rate of poverty. How did, has the pandemic over the last year affected the community from your vantage point? Well, with a lot of our uh, residents being... Uh, essential workers and some being non-essential workers. We've had a lot of people that have not been in, able to go to work and then a lot of people that have been going to work and potentially uh, infecting themselves with the COVID virus. And that has caused a problem for a lot of our residents. So, you know, some not being able to go and, and able to support their family, some being able to go and put themselves in a, in a harm's way in order to be able to support their family. Do you see that situation improving now, even though the vaccination rate is lagging behind here, it's, it's, it's up in other areas? 
Yes. Well, the resources that the village of Riverdale has put in place to try to help our residents get vaccinated has been tremendous. Um, our, our board has had a widespread amount of information go out to our residents to let them know where they can get vaccinated. We do have a location in our town at the CVS that you can go and get vaccinated. We work with Cook County to be able to get our residents to be able to go to South Suburban College where it's a large vaccination site. Uh, there's another site in Calumet Park at the Walgreens, and there's multiple sites in Blue Island through Cook County Department of Health. So we have been, as a community and as, as an administration, trying to get our residents more informed about what's been going on and get them any kind of resources that we can in order to help them become vaccinated. And, and, and that's the barrier that we hear from all the providers. So you do have these places, at least around uh, in South Holland, Calumet City, but people are still skeptical. They still, they, they still don't know that they can trust a vaccine. How do you fix that? Well, unfortunately, because there's such a low amount of data about the vaccine and with the uh, recent situation with Johnson & Johnson, a lot of people are skeptical and, and afraid of what actually could be happening with the vaccine. And what we do is we constantly put out positive and factual information about the vaccine so that people can be well informed about how it does help and how it will prevent things from happening as far as contracting COVID and actually spreading COVID. All right, Fire Chief Mick Smith here in the village of Riverdale, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it. And Brandis, uh, we will be back with Cook County Commissioner Deborah Sims with more on that. And the housing situation here, there's an eviction moratorium, as you know, and that is really helping out residents here in the Southland. So obviously they want that to stick around a bit. Brandis, we'll toss it back to you for now. Yeah, yeah here's a lot of concern for folks, I'm sure. We'll see you in a bit for that. For pregnant women, current fetal monitoring, devi monitoring devices are a cumbersome array of wires and tape that require constant adjustments and quite literally tether an expectant mother to a hospital bed. Now a team of researchers at Northwestern University have developed a suite of wireless devices that can do all that current monitors do, but at much less cost and without those constraints. Joining us now to talk about these new monitors is the leader of the research team, John Rogers, professor of materials science and engineering, biomedical engineering and neurological surgery at Northwestern University. John, welcome back. Um, so what were the challenges with current technology that led you to want to develop these new monitors? Well, first of all, th thanks for having me and, and thanks for your interest in, in our work. I think you kind of outlined it pretty effectively. I mean, the uh, current hospital standards for monitoring the health of the mother and uh, and the fetus and uh, the neonate immediately after birth involve really kind of a rat's nest of, of wired based sensors that mount at different locations of the body and terminate at bedside you know level data acquisition electronics and uh, you know the birthing process and giving birth involves lots of motion and those wires become severe constraints not only for the expecting mother but also for the healthcare professionals who are who are involved in the in the birth process. And so we wanted to get rid of all of that kind of hardware, old style hardware, and move to a, a purely wireless based, based platform to, uh, to really liberate uh, women from, from these kinds of uh, and, cumbersome monitoring John, systems. John, explain how these new monitors work um, and what makes them obviously superior to the ones that are uh, currently being used. Yeah, so they actually uh, reproduce all of the measurements uh, that, that are made typically, even in the most advanced hospital setting. But, but that, those measurements are accomplished with uh, Band-Aid style devices. I mean, they're thin, they're soft, they're flexible, they're fully wireless. They mount at relevant parts of the anatomy, the chest of the mother, the belly, uh, her finger. Uh, to really monitor all vital signs associated with the mother as well as the fetus. And they're uh, all operating in a time synchronized fashion, streaming data to just a conventional smartphone, uh, so uh, thereby reducing the cost uh, as well. What kind of information can your monitors collect uh, that wasn't previously being collected by the, the old school wired monitors? Well, we're doing everything that's that's been done in the past with these kind of old old style uh, devices. So we're uh, capturing uterine contractions. We're doing fetal blood oxygenation. We're doing uh, temperature, heart rate, respiration rate of the mother. But we're also capturing continuous blood pressure. We're getting fetal heart rate again continuously. We're measuring the body orientation and the activity levels of, of the mother. We're capturing cardiac sounds uh, as well as uh, ECG measurements and 
All of it's done with a higher level of fidelity uh, as well as um, you know, eliminating the wires. You eliminate that, that cumbersome tether, but you also eliminate a lot of the noise that's induced by the wires themselves. So, so the data fidelity is higher and we're capturing a much broader suite of health-related parameters, both of the mother and the fetus. How might these be useful? I would imagine, you know, especially in rural areas or women who want to have home births, uh, developing nations. Yeah, well, one of the exciting things about this program and what we've uh, just recently published is we uh, were able to team with the Gates Foundation and the Save the Children organization to put these devices in lower and middle income countries. So we've uh, monitored almost uh, 500 uh, women in Zambia during childbirth, straight through the anti, intra, and postpartum periods. And uh, that's very exciting because the cost structure uh, allows these kinds of platforms to be inserted even in these uh, highly resource-constrained, resource challenging areas of the globe where, quite frankly, they add the most value. Uh, you know, and, and I think that that's a very, very exciting part of, of what we're doing. And you mentioned uh, the Gates Foundation and Save the Children uh, and working with them in development. Why is this something that those two organizations are interested in? Well, they're interested in saving lives, you know, in, in those sort of challenging parts of the globe. And if you think about mortality and you think about women, childbirth represents the most dangerous activity that they'll engage in in their entire lives. And uh, currently, there's really no monitoring technology at all in many parts of these countries. We're in Zambia, Kenya, and Ghana. And so, so the need is very strong. And uh, you know, being able to monitor and to intervene quickly if there are problems during childbirth can, can save lives, quite frankly. What could it cost uh, to develop these monitors and, um, and to deploy them once they are ready for, for prime time? Yeah, so that's a very important question. I think the Gates Foundation, Save the Children organization, they're really only interested in technologies that have cost structures that enable their deployment in these parts of the world. And so you think about the cost per patient per day is the, is the way you think about it. Um, and because the devices are reusable, because they involve rechargeable batteries, because you, know, you can use a smartphone for the monitor and smartphones already exist even in these parts of the, the world, you end up with cost estimates at uh, you know full scale deployment volumes of a few cents per patient day is, is the way you think about it. Wow. Um, so what would the next step for these monitors uh, be then, and when might we see them uh, deployed in hospitals both here and abroad? Yeah. So it's really all about the uh, FDA approval process at this point, and so we're deep into that regulatory you know process. I think we're probably a couple of months out from getting our first approved indications uh, for, for these devices, and that will be a, uh, an exciting milestone for us. And that's really the trigger, that, that's the gating item in getting these devices out at scale. We've already put together a supply chain and the manufacturing flow, and we know how to scale up the production of these devices, but you know, they're yielding vital signs information that are crit that's critical to patient care, and so that FDA approval process is very important, and, and we're in the latter stages of that. Okay. Well, best of luck to you. We look forward to hearing more uh, when, when you get there. Thanks, John Rogers. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Up next, monitoring a different kind of mother and her kids. Stick around to see what I mean. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. Nothing quite says spring better than signs of new life. And thanks to our favorite piping plovers, Monty and Rose, we've got just that on Montrose Beach. WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley joins us now with more. Patty, I don't think I've ever been so excited about this. So um, <laughs> the Chicago Park District discovered that Monty and Rose's nest does have eggs in it. Um, what do we know about the eggs and when can we expect them to hatch? Sure, yeah, it's very exciting. We're all like expectant mothers right now. Uh, they found three eggs in the nest, which was uh, confirmed this week. And they've now uh, put an enclosure over it, a wire enclosure to protect them because there might be a fourth on the way. That's the usual amount that plovers lay. And uh, about a month from now, we could be seeing some chicks. Okay, so is there anything unique about this year's nesting site? We're looking at some pictures of it now and it looks interesting. Yeah, um, conservationists, bird lovers are ecstatic because this is an area of Montrose Beach that was just about a month ago actually set aside by the Park District as part of a protected natural area. 
So bird lovers thought that this might be where the plovers would nest. They asked the park district to set it aside as a protected area. The park district did, and lo and behold, as they're saying, if you build it, they will come, and that's where the birds decided to put their nest. And the plovers are here. All right, I'm sure we'll hear more from you again in a month about whether or not we've got some little <laughs> for baby, sure. some little monies and roses. All right, <laughs> Patty Wetley, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Patty's full story on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. And now we check back in with Paris Schutz, who spent the day reporting in South Suburban Riverdale as a part of our In Your Neighborhood series. He's there now with a Cook County Commissioner, Paris. Yeah, we're here with Cook County Commissioner Deborah Sims, whose district includes Riverdale and other Southland suburbs. Commissioner Sims, thank you for being out here with us. Thank you for having me. So we talked about the reasons for, for lower vaccine rates in, in places like Riverdale, a lack of access to health care, transportation, and then trust. Trust is a big factor. So what, what can you do at the county level to, to, to improve on that? Well, I think we have to be creative in trying to uh, do more things and make more uh, facilities available for people to come and get their shots. And I think we're trying to do that. Uh, you know, when the shots first came out, they had so many stipulations on them. You had to make sure that they were a certain temperature and then that eased up, but you still have to keep them cold. So you have to be able to put them where they're safe and where that you know that what the, sh the vaccine that you're putting in people's arms are safe. Mm -hmm. and, and as I understand, you are vaccinated, but you were a little worried about it yourself. Well, I wasn't worried about the vaccine. I'm afraid of needles. Mm -hmm. So being afraid of needles, the vaccine part of it didn't bother me at all. It's just I've never had a shot in my arm. Mm -hmm. I always tell the doctors, if you can't give it to me in my hip, I'm not taking it. Mm -hmm. So I've been lucky that I've never had to take a shot in my arm. So this was the first time that I took a shot in my arm. And believe it or not, the reservists that gave it to me uh, was really, really good. Never felt a thing. Well, then if you can do it, anybody can do it. Yes, they can. All right, so another big issue related to COVID is housing. Uh, you know, we, we mentioned in Riverdale, there are 26% of residents live below the poverty level. There is still an eviction moratorium. What happens here in the Southland, in, in the surrounding suburbs, if that is lifted? And what, what can you do for residents? I am very fearful of that. I mean, I would hope that I, I, the sad part about this is that you know that people that are renting, they're renting from people that have a mortgage sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the bank still wants their money. So what do you do with the renter that has to pay rent who has a, 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 a more, the owner has a mortgage that he has to pay? So it, it's difficult, and I, I guess we're going to have to depend on the federal government to send more, more money if they can. And I mean, Cook County put together a fund. We there did. Been efforts at the county level We did. As well. We're doing everything that we can to help renters. Uh, we have all kind of programs uh, for people to apply for. Uh, I think it was three or six months, if I'm not mistaken, that you could get your uh, uh, mortgage rental assistant. Mm -hmm. So we're trying. We're doing everything we possibly can. All right, Cook County Commissioner Deborah Sims, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And Brandis, we're going to wrap it up here in Riverdale in just a bit, but now we toss it back to you. Paris, thank you. Up next, the legacy of Helmut Jan in an all-new Ask Jeffrey. But first, a look at the weather. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation. 81-year-old German architect Helmut Jahn died last weekend after he was struck by a car while riding a bicycle in the western suburbs. Jahn is known for designing groundbreaking buildings all over the world and many right here in his adopted city of Chicago. Jeffrey Baer joins us now with a look at Jan's work and legacy in a special edition of Ask Jeffrey. And Jeffrey, you know, obviously a very tragic loss for the for the architecture community. Oh, it was so sad and so shocking that it happened so quickly. 
So, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the question is, and this comes from Chicago Tonight staff, Helmut Jan is best known in Chicago for designing the Thompson Center in the Loop, but there's a lot more to his story, isn't there? Jeffrey? Certainly there is. Um, as you said, the Thompson Center has, you know, been controversial since the day it opened and now more than ever with the battle to sell it or save it. Uh, but I wonder if people realize they know his buildings all over the city and suburbs. Jan's United Terminal at O'Hare was inspired by the design of grand old Chicago railway terminals that light let light in through the ceiling from above. Um, he also designed the jazzy subterranean passageway there at O'Hare that takes you to a satellite terminal. And he even designed the O'Hare L terminal using curves and color to bring drama to an otherwise drab underground space. Um, then there's his annex to the Chicago Board of Trade, uh, built directly behind the famous Art Deco tower that looms over Chicago's financial district. Um, it's basically a shorter glass version of the older tower, complete with the pyramid-shaped roof and ornament on the top, echoing the original. Um, there's the cascading blue glass of Metra's Ogilvy Transportation Center, now known as Accenture Tower, um, which from certain angles looks like waves, like, like a waterfall almost falling off the building. And Jan even designed suburban buildings like the N-shaped tower that screams Naperville to <laughs> motorists on I-88. Okay, so there is a theme of buildings that, you know, sort of break the mold of uh, the more restrained modern architecture. And Jan himself was a person with a certain panache, Jeffrey. Oh, you bet. Um, uh, when he came to prominence in the 70s and 80s, uh, Jan's outsized personality and lifestyle drew as much attention as his buildings. He even made the cover of GQ magazine in 1985. When the magazine came out, Jan threw a copy of it on the desk of one of his staff architects who was also pictured anonymously in the fashion spread and said, if you're important, they print your name in the magazine. Uh, <laughs> some critics derisively nicknamed him Flash Gordon, meaning that he was like a flash in the pan that wouldn't last. But he embraced that and used the name on a string of racing sailboats that he owned. Um, Jan's bravado was also part of his success, according to IIT School of Architecture Dean uh, Reed Kroloff. Here's a bit of what Reed told us. He was part of a group of people, uh, architect that that, occur, that um, became prominent in the latter part of the 20th century, where we invented the term star architect, um, where like like a star chef or someone else, um, the personality became uh, very much a part of the entire package of architecture that was being created. And and Helmut certainly understood that. He certainly understood how to incorporate the media into his campaign for making buildings. Now, Jeffrey, Jan was German, but, you know, Chicago became his hometown. Well, that's right. Um, he moved here in the mid-1960s to study under the renowned German-born architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe at, at IIT. Um, and the imprint of Mies and those other modernists with their restrained less is more philosophy is obvious in what Jan considered his first building, and many people don't know this, the McCormick Place Convention Center on the lakefront, which he helped to design under architect Gene Summers in the late 1960s after he joined the firm of C.F. Murphy. Uh, Jan later took over that firm and he began pushing back against the strict right angles and dark colors of modernist architecture, uh, even at IIT itself, where he designed this shiny, curvy dormitory. Um, some of Jan's favorite projects outside the U.S., and he's famous all over the world, uh, included the uh, Messeturm Tower in Frankfurt, one of the tallest buildings in Europe in the 1990s. Um, there's also the, his sprawling airport in Bangkok, Thailand, one of several airports Jan worked on, and especially the Sony Center in Berlin from the year 2000, which might remind viewers of the Thompson Center with its soaring atrium and spaceship-like exterior. Jan considered this complex of eight buildings one of his finest works. And uh, the Thompson Center, you know, always remained one of his favorites as well. But of course, it was back in the news recently as the state announced that it has put the property up for sale. That's right. Um, after many years of speculation about this, the cash strapped state of Illinois finally announced that it does intend to sell the building. Uh, many people over the years have criticized its shape and its colors, um, which are 
shocking contrast with the surrounding buildings and state workers have complained about heating and cooling malfunctions as well as noise from the huge atrium. But the building's defenders say most of those problems could have been avoided if the state had used better construction materials and had kept up with the maintenance instead of just neglecting it for years and years. Um, here's Jan himself responding to some of that criticism in a Chicago Tonight interview. Uh, this was from 2003. Well, there are always the people who lead, and there are always the people who follow. You know? and, uh, and I think if our world wouldn't uh, reach for new ways how to do things, not only just to build, but how to live, and how to move, and mm -hmm. how uh, we get from place A to place B, then we all still would be living in caves. <laughs> That's classic helmet, Jan. Uh, the proposed sale has ignited a fierce preservation battle. Preservation groups argue that the building is a monumental achievement, creating a much needed vast enclosed public space for everyone to enjoy. And of course, we'll be watching more of that as, uh, as that sale or, or the preservation battle proceeds. For now, Jeffrey Baer, thank you so much for, for joining us. My pleasure. And you can visit our website for more on the legacy of Helmut Jahn, including a Chicago Tonight segment from the opening ceremony of the Thompson Center in 1985. And while you're there, don't forget to submit your own question to Jeffrey Baer. That's at WTTW.com slash Ask Jeffrey. As the development of NFTs or non-fungible tokens gives artists more autonomy over their artwork and how it's shared in a digital capacity, a new exhibit is showcasing how this type of digital art can take over physical spaces. Arts correspondent Angel Edo recently shared details about this new concept and what it could mean for the future of art as we know it. Here's another look. Imagine an infinity room filled with mirrors, and at the center sits a monitor displaying digital art that projects moving images across the room. You have just entered the quantum mirror. Those digitized moving images are known as NFTs or non-fungible tokens. Now, traditionally, artists have had trouble monitoring the use of their work online, but NFTs allow them to create a digital tracker, if you will, that accompanies their work wherever it's sent. I get to choose how ownership is transferred, whether it's a partial transfer of ownership, whether it's a, an ownership with royalty rights, whether it's a you know, in addition, it, the, the artist has a lot of consent and a lot of power in this transaction, which is why it's so groundbreaking. Quantum Mirror is on display at the Art Space 8 Gallery and works as a metaphor for how one's life can be entangled with technology. Now, because the mirrors allow this NFT to fully encompass a physical space, that makes Quantum Mirror the first ever NFT sculpture. A sculpture is any piece of three-dimensional artwork, right? And so these mirrors create a three-dimensional world that, that exists around these NFTs, and the NFTs are the core of it that are then projected and reflected into infinity. This piece is exactly the same as what's happening inside of Quantum Mirror, but this really exists here just to illustrate the difference between what an NFT is and what a physical object is and to kind of prompt that conversation. Just like NFTs encourage artists to have agency over their work, the quantum mirror encourages viewers to have agency over themselves and recognize how outside influences can inhibit that. The animations in quantum mirror are essentially repeti infinite repetitions of bodies. In the same way that social media is creating infinite repetitions of a, an aesthetic, an influence, an idea, um, to the point that people are losing their originality. We need to be aware of the fact that that is happening to our consciousness because when we're not aware of that, then our code is essentially cracked. We become entrenched and influenced in a way by social media, by the screens, that it changes our view of the world outs outside of us so much that we're not even able to tell right from wrong anymore. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. And the Quantum Mirror exhibit at Artspace 8 is open Monday through Saturday until the end of this month. You can visit our website for more information. 
And Paris joins us again live from suburban Riverdale, where he spent the day reporting as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Paris, I hear the train that always manages to find you. Um, we know that in the effort to get those vaccine rates up there in Riverdale, I understand there are going to be some events happening in the area. Tell us about those. Yeah, there's an event at Calumet Park this weekend. There's a CVS around here. There's a site in Matson nearby in the Park District here in Riverdale. It's helping coordinate with residents, uh, getting residents to one of those places to get their first or second shot. So that's key here. And as we heard over and over, we hear this everywhere. The real key to, to get through that hesitancy barrier is to have a trusted doctor. Ideally, if you have a primary care physician, they're the ones that you want to listen to when you have all these questions about the vaccine. And, and that's what sort of kept the vaccine rate low in certain communities that many people don't have the primary care uh, physician. So when it comes to health, who do you trust? Is it just social media, your neighbor, the media? So uh, all those things are issues. And Brandis, now we'll toss it back to you. Yeah, a lot of work uh, to still be done on that, Paris. A long way to go. Uh, that is our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night for the Weekend Review. And now for all of us, I'm Paris Schutz. I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Clifford Law Offices and Robert A. Clifford, a member of the National Advisory Board for the Advocacy Institute, a national initiative to train law students to become the best advocates in the profession.